computer. And it should be good. It should be recording right now. So, yeah, as I, as I was telling Dave, I said, welcome. You know, I'm tutoring some, some kids online. And every kid is different. What works with one, I think, okay, I'll do that same winning formula with my other one. And I have to change it up every time. Some like to do their writing before reading, some reading, you know, every kid is different. And that's why these one size fits all programs, why some of us in the meaning based community just don't appreciate it because teachers think they have to implement them with fidelity, meaning you have to read the directions and follow the directions just as. And good teachers take these things and they they implement them, but yet they adopt and adapt them based on the needs of their students. And that's why we must empower teachers. School districts and schools that are trying to force teachers to do the curriculum as written are really practicing educational malpractice. So everything has to be adopted and adapted. Sorry, I was off on a tangent, David. No, no, no. You're just doing your stick, and I get that. That's cool. <laughs> my stick is who I am. I live. <laughs> yeah, my exactly. Well, it's, yeah, something's got to pay the rent there, right? So I get that. <laughs> I, I just, uh, yeah. How much money do I make? And, and listen, I I agree with um, you know, when I talk with teachers, I tell them the, the most important thing they can bring to teaching is their own learning, right? They've got to be constantly learning to modulate what they're doing in an adaptive response to what the learners are doing. That said. You know there there's prerequisites right so if, if somebody somebody wants to uh be a good uh quarterback or a good whatever you know play some sports position it's not like they're going to just throw them out there without doing certain prerequisite things to build them up to being proximately ready for that challenge so the you know there's an argument in, you know with respect to reading where there are things that it's helpful to kind of exercise i mean knowing the the names of the letters of the alphabet right uh, there are certain uh, abstract uh, building block things that are necessary prerequisites after that yeah i agree with you everything should be adaptive and i'm glad you talked about that teacher knowledge and teacher preparation you know the difference between experts and novices is having that body of knowledge and expert teachers this isn't me but not being roboticized by it well, there's four kinds of knowledge. You have to have knowledge of learners and learning, how humans learn. You have to have pedagogical knowledge, which is general teaching strategies. Pedagogical content knowledge, which is strategies for the content areas, math methods, reading methods, science methods. And you have to have knowledge of content. Those are the four types of knowledge. And experts have more knowledge. Novices have less of it. We've got three semesters in a teacher preparation program plus student teaching. There's absolutely no way we can create even close to an expert teacher. And it's silly to think that way. They come into us with little knowledge, but they leave with shallow and disjointed bits of knowledge. They're ready to start the journey, but they are far from experts. And I think people think you can come from three semesters of a teacher preparation program and be a finished teaching product. Was that a tangent? Yeah, you know, I, I, no, no, I mean, I, I, first of all, I'm kind of good with going where we're going. Our, I think our, our meta intent today was to get into science in general and the science of reading in particular. And this is a decent takeoff ramp to get into those spaces. I would say with respect to teaching, I had uh, the honor and pleasure to, to interview some people who studied teachers on a macro level from uh, people at the Hoover Institute, like uh, Hannah Sheck to Martin Haberman, who runs the Haberman Institute and in, uh, up in your neck of the woods, I think, or at least he did. And Richard Allington, before being involved in whole language, he spent, or parallel to his involvement in whole language related to enterprises, he was very focused on understanding teacher behavior. And what was most amazing to me about the convergence of all of those studies about what makes effective teaching was that it was not necessarily how much they were paid. It was not necessarily how much they knew. It was not so much the credentials they had. It was not necessarily how touchy feely they were and how good they made people feel, how good they made the, the students feel. It was not their warm demeanor. It was their 
uh, invitation to turn taking participation so that they weren't just cramming something, they were putting forth something and then seeing what the learner brought back and constantly encouraging the learner to inform them about what to be doing. So, which directly lines up with what was the most effective thing. If you look at the, I mentioned Hart Risley work the last time, the studies of the early language patterns of children coming out of different kinds of families from taciturn to more talkative. Mm -hmm. And in those conversation spaces, what they found was is that the parents that engaged children in the most turn-taking, elaborative conversations were the ones that were building children's kind of vocabulary and verbal musculature, so to speak, and predicted their later success with reading. So in all these cases, teachers and parents, it's not so much what they know. It's not so much following some script. It's, it's about how they're live on the edge themselves learning to differentiate what they're doing. So they still got to bring what you're talking about, but they can't bring it statically or mechanically or robotically. So what you talked about was general pedagogical knowledge, general teaching strategies, and knowledge of learners and learning. And as informing what I described, that's not what I described. Those are things that are in the background informing what I'm describing, but they're not. Well, probably same. you have to have that knowledge. You have to have that knowledge to be an expert teacher. And that's part of it. And, you know, reading the research on teacher education, colleges of education matter. Comparing the, the fast track teacher programs, we just throw them in there and see who sticks. That teachers who have gone through teacher preparation programs have better success with students as measured by achievement tests and are rated as better teachers. Uh, Linda Darlene Hammond did this research by their supervisors when compared larger sample size. This idea that anyone can teach will just throw them into the classroom. How would you like your kid having a teacher who's learning on the job? That's not fair to our kids. We need well-prepared expert teachers. Well, I'd, I'd much rather have them learning on the job than being a robot of, of what they've been taught. No, so I want I want both. I want both. I want I want somebody who's who's well uh, versed in the field that they're going to be interacting with the children with, and that that's in the background, not the foreground. That's that's informing how they're learning to adapt that to the students. And I don't so think if they're following that robotically, then th th they should be replaced. And I don't think anyone wants a robot, except maybe the science of reading people. We want teachers with uh, background yeah. knowledge to uh, apply what's in front of them. Nobody wants a robot, absolutely not. But you have to have a teacher toolbox full of research-based strategies. That's the best way to teach reading. Well, research-based strategy seems like a good segue to get into science. Oh, good one, yes. Master of the segue. Yeah, well, so- <laughs> what um, is science? What is reading what science? Is science? What is knowledge? Well, yeah, let's start. I think let's take take some time with science because uh, on the one hand, I think um, Einstein said uh, with respect to the rational mind in general, and I think referring to science as well, that it's a fantastic slave and it's a terrible master. You know, that, that um, <clears throat> science is the way that we fill in the paradigms, but it's rarely the way that we create them. Right. So, so let, why, don't you, why don't you get started with where you wanted to go with science and then I will. Um, well, in general, and probably when you look at the social sciences and educational science specifically, there's often a different paradigm. And sometimes people coming from the hard sciences, when you only know the experimental model, they tend to think, well, that is the model that must be used in all of reality. When in essence, science at its basic is asking a question, using data to answer the question. That's what science is at its basic level. And science is a verb. It's a process to science. Yeah, I, I mean, so science is a mo learning modality. And right? it's a consensual collective learning modality, consensual and collective in the sense that uh, in order for it to have any meaning outside of the person that's doing it, it has to adhere to and conform with certain accepted standards of what 
uh, constitutes good evidence, what constitutes good practice, right? So there's a series of conventions that are associated with science in any one particular discipline. Inside of that, it's a learning modality. It's a way of learning that's cons consensualizable, you might say. Way of, uh, way of understanding the world around us. And methods, methods of science are the systematic processes we use. And you are right. Uh, they are uh, conferred by the field and science, and it's a part of research. And the thing that separates science and research from I thinkisms and data is peer review, blind peer review. So I often say this. Which doesn't necessarily make anything right. It just yes. makes things uh, consensualized. Yes, as I was saying, research is not research unless and until it has been subjected to blind peer review. There's no such thing as a perfect objective science. It is simply one more filter. But without that filter, it doesn't even get in the conversation. So blind peer review published in academic journals. No, there's no such thing as the perfect article. Science does not prove. Science uh, supports a hypothesis, but it's ever evolving. So you can never say it has proven once and for all that. At one time, gravity, you know, the, th the theory of gravity, and we can get into theories, but you know, that has been changing based on data, but that has been changing. Yeah. Aristotle, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and there's current thinking that changes even that. So yeah, for sure. And this brings up an important point, how science changes and the resistance to change within science. I, I interviewed a guy who was the head of the Stanford Free Press. He was a geologist, a friend of Stephen Jay Gould, if you know that field in the kind of punctuated equilibrium of evolution theories. Yep. Anyway, he interviewed 600 geologists just before the te tectonic plate revolution changed the geological understanding of the planet. And then he interviewed them after. And if you compare it, the 600 scientists before the plate, uh, the tectonic plate uh, uh, revolution in geology, all said that it was never going to be that way. I mean, he's got the 600, the transcripts, I mean, it's an amazing body of work. He's a historian of science. Um, they were all against this theory. And then once it was adopted, 10 years later, we went back to interview them, and they had all said, well, that's what we were all about all the way, all the, in the beginning, right? This story goes on and on. There's a, a big famous movie character coming out right now, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is another example of the, what I call paradigm inertia in science, right? Just like I just described with geology. In the case of Oppenheimer, um, one of his students at Caltech um, that was responsible for a major theoretical component of the atom bomb by the a physicist by the name of David Bohm, um, for a number of reasons, uh, Bohm uh, wrote the textbook that would become the standard textbook for quantum mechanics in colleges throughout the world. He became a friend of Einstein. He was Einstein's dialogue partner, Einstein's spiritual son by Einstein's recollection. Went on to become the Dalai Lama's science teacher, right? So he was all over the place, this giant of a physicist. At one point in time, he proposed an alternative theory for quantum mechanics. Right, one that's, that's just now the world's catching up to. And at the time, Oppenheimer calls a conference of the world's leading physicists without inviting this guy Bohm to it and says, listen, we're gonna do everything we can to disprove him. And if we can't disprove him, we're gonna all agree to ignore him. And they did. And the same thing goes on. If you study the history of nuclear reactors and how we got into the messes we did, the same kind of paradigm inertia paralyzes science, just like it does our individual psychology. So science is an instrument that can be trusted when it's looking inside of a space that we kind of can agree on, but it's not very good at seeing outside of its box. And there's just, the history of science is, is full of examples of this paradigm inertia, which is at the heart of what's going on in the reading wars and in the sciences of today. So I'm glad you made that segue. You know, there is no reading wars, by the way. Science is used to create research and a research study becomes a data dot and at this dot to dot picture called a theory. A theory is the way to explain a set of facts and the facts are created by research. You have a whole bunch of dots out there 
and different theories explain different data dots differently. That's why you can have two sets of research-based theories, both explaining the same thing differently. Theories are either robust or weak. Now, people become data resistant when they cling too tightly to a particular theory. And that's, yeah, what's that's, happening my, that's what I was with, just describing, what I call exactly, paradigm I'm putting it in reading terms. That's what happens with the science of reading who are clinging to this phonological processing model, this simple view of reading, this bottom up theory. And just like the people you mentioned, data or people that do not conform to that theory are called kooks, or it is uh, that's not val, you know, it's becomes data resistant. The data is ignored. And that yeah, is. Yeah, I don't think it, it, data is very hyper specific. I think it's paradigm. It's the whole paradigm because the paradigm is what interprets the data, right? The data, the data, you can take the data and look at it from this lens or look at it from this lens. So the paradigm creates a frame of reference for the interpretation of data inside the mental model sets within that paradigm. And it's that's where the, the problem lies, not in the, the data. I mean, the, the science of reading people would say the exact same thing about you guys, your side of the equation. You know, I, I differentiate between a paradigm and a theory. A paradigm is a general way the field perceives. A theory is a way to explain a set of facts and understand phenomena. Now, when I do get in discussions, try to with science of reading people and ask what I got wrong, uh, I usually get a lot of name calling and pejoratives without actually addressing the facts. And that is what is frustrating for me. I can sure. point specifically to research data that is ignored by the simple view of reading, those that cling tightly like pigs at their mother's teat to this theory without letting go. Miscue analysis, eye movement research, these sorts of things, um, priming studies in cognitive science. These all provide data for an interactive that supports an interactive theory of reading that's what's in the head interacts with what's on the page. This sure, of course. I don't think anybody argues with that. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. The bottom up, as you, as you just stated, that 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 that. I mean, reading is not a passive process; it's an interactive process. The brain is involved in constructing the meaning. There's no we question agree. about that. Absolutely, you and I agree on that. But oh, they agree on it too. They just <laughs> agree. They just their their difference with you is in what is the what is informing the construction of meaning whether or not it's internal to the word working out the word or to what degree is the word understanding the word recognizing the word identifying the word getting the meaning of the word popping the word whatever word you want to use for that process um, do you go extraneous to the word to get information that informs it that's the difference not whether or not there's an interactive process, whether or not the interactive process is in decoding, differentiating, recognizing the word from the word, or recognizing the word from its surrounds and from its uh, position in the flow. And that's what's the difference. This is a good thing that you brought up, Dave. You know, really, if we can, David, I'm sorry. Do you like Dave or David? I don't care. Okay. I can call you whatever. <laughs> you can call me whatever. Okay. You can call me kook. That'll be fine. It'll be, I'll put in a badge here called, he called me kook. I don't care. Okay, kook. No, okay. I there really you know. like how you started to differentiate between, you know, what are the differences? And yeah, that's why we're here, right? That is why we're here. And it's not necessarily, I think you and I agree on many things. But it becomes the level of the word. You have to identify the word before meaning is created. That's more science of reading stuff. And people with an interactive meaning base says they sometimes you don't have to know what the word is. As a matter of fact, you actually skip over 60% of the words that you're using top-down information more than bottom-up. Doesn't mean that letters are important, but brain research shows there is 10 times more information flowing from the cortex down than the thalamus up during the act of reading. Yeah, look, I mean, 
as you know, I, I mentioned I spent quite a bit of time with Keith Rayner. I spent a lot of time with the neuroscientists and cognitive scientists that are behind the science of reading that are the kind of archetypal godfathers of the what became today's science of reading. And um, they would differ with this. I mean, for example, with the eye movement stuff, Keith Rayner would say, you, you, you can watch the eyes and infer the processing, and there's no question about it that the eyes are stuttering when they encounter an unfamiliar word, that the more difficult the word is, not in terms of some abstract understanding of what makes a word difficult, but the actual experience of it being difficult for the reader themselves causes a bog in attention that disrupts the whole process, and that that's directly related to the difficulty of recognizing a word. <laughs> And that they're doing this across not only isolated words, which we've had that conversation before, but across the flow of sentences and paragraphs and larger bodies of text and then meta-analyzing that. So I think their perspective would be um, that, yes, there's no question that what you've read is informing, is particularly when you come to homophones and other words where there's possible multiple meanings that could come out of the word even after you recognize it, that the flow of meaning is definitely informing how you're experiencing the words that you're recognizing, but that recognition itself is fundamentally tied to working out recognition from the words rather than backfilling it or guessing it or in inferring what it must be based on extraneous to the word information. That's where I think the argument is. And Keith Rayner says what's in the head is directing the eyes. That's what yeah. Keith Rayner says. What is in the head is directing eye movements, not what's on. Yeah, and the, the eye movements are stopping and stuttering according to the complexity or the difficulty that the brain is having in recognizing a word. Absolutely. The sight words, the function words, like in the of, are skipped over. The content words that are more difficult are fixated more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and depending upon their difficulty in recognition, all the, there that's where the gradient is that's where the problem is that's where the bottleneck to fluid processing is and here i would go to research by stephen Kosur, who says you know the length of the word has nothing to do with i agree with processing. that yeah that's not, I, I, I said I, when i said difficulty i was careful to to clarify that what i meant by difficulty was not an abstract description of its difficulty like by word length, et cetera, but the, the actual experience of difficulty by that particular reader. So perhaps unfamiliarity with the word or letter patterns. Right? Yeah, I used unfamiliarity before and we got into all kinds of about that, right? Whether it was identification or recognition, so I said pop, whatever word you want to use, the time, the, when the word gets into the flow, into the stream, right? Whatever, we, whatever however we want to describe that, the various layers of that. And my understanding is, is that, um, yes, there's certainly all kinds of sight words that is particularly even a beginning reader picks up on and they're blowing through those fast. It's the, there's words that, that the bottleneck to processing, the bottleneck that's causing the stutter, that's causing it to be frustrating, that's causing it to be, build up to shaming out, all the rest of that stuff, the, the, the bottleneck to proceeding progressively into becoming a better reader is stuttering and stumbling on unfamiliar words, on words that are difficult to recognize. That that's what I understand the um, consensus is amongst the science of reading scientists from a cognitive neuroscience and from an eye movement study point of view. Well, it's interesting. I read the same research and, and get different interpretations of that research, even when I read Yeah, it. there we go to paradigms. That's what I was saying a few steps back. Yeah. But, you know, the idea, this is why getting back to the what happens in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, this is why there are some sight words, like in the and, you have to recognize on site. That's why they're called sight words. And yep. you should leave kindergarten having about 40 sight words that you know. There, there are some words that you recognize patterns. If we focus only on phonics, if we over phonicize, now everyone believes in phonics, but if that's all we do, that's what's created. I don't, don't put me in the everyone nope. camp. I don't believe in it at all. I think it's a bastardized patch overlaid on a messed up orthography that just happens to have gotten traction because of the arguments that have gone on in the reading words that you don't think are reading words. If if people overemphasize phonics, that creates yep. the 
the bottleneck and I can give you a, a hint. And this is why we do a lot of different types of activities so that we're fully using the brain. I think I had a, I had two, I had a young girl who would stop and spend about 10 seconds going letter by letter. And when I told her, and it would take 10 seconds, when I said, well, just try saying blank and moving on, it would take her two seconds. She'd get the yeah. word and she came back. That, yeah. that freed up that bottleneck. That doesn't mean you don't use phonics, but it means you help students incorporate all parts of their brain. Another girl said, young lady, third grader, uh, she called me Dr. Hay, you're magic because now the word just pops into my head. Well, she'd been struggling with phonics and she wasn't good at that. And the trouble is, and this is from the National Reading Panel Report that says, you know, after first grade, if you're a struggling reader, phonics has limited uh, impact. But what do we do with struggling readers? We give them more phonics so they can be not good at what they're not good at even more. Yeah. Look, 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 I'm like, I'm, if you've been tracking me, first of all, we're starting to recycle on things we've talked about before, which Thank is you. okay. I mean, all right. Um, one, two, um, I think that all of these strategies to try to um, get a word to pop, whether they're phonics or they're searching around the word for extraneous to the word cues and information to inform recognition or it's you know interpreting from a from a picture all of these extraneous to the word and internal to the word strategies for recognizing a word are only necessary because the orthography is not transparent and that, oh, that they're yeah. all bastardized adaptations to work around the fact that we've got a, a, a fundamentally messed up code I don't think we're going to change the code, David, unless you're more powerful than I think you are. Yeah, the, someday they, uh, I would guess it'll probably take another decade or so. But yes, it'll be just insane that we ever had these kind of conversations. Yep. But here's, here's the thing, you know, is there some research that you can point me to? And I, there may be, I don't know, that says children in a rules-based orthography learn to read faster and are further ahead at at uh fourth fifth grade then people yeah i'll send you stuff there there uh marquita Car caravolis uh, is probably the international leader in she's in scotland i think on orthographic depth uh hypothesis studies and research but i cited before and you kind of blew it off and i didn't challenge you on the blow it off part um, um I didn't blow Stanislaus, it off. I, I said a uh, thing about the Italians that kids and Italians can yeah. read and learn to read in, in three months and it takes a English students two to three years. So why that big magnitude of difference? Um, and uh, he and other neuroscientists would say, well, it's the complexity of the orthography. I, I didn't blow you off. I said, I'm. I, it may be, it sounds logically, but in the world of academia, we don't come to conclusions based on I thinkisms, based on well, this is not, no, no, not this you, was not based you. on studies. Yeah. But this so, is why but, I hesitated coming to a conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Blow it off was a too strong a word. You're yeah, right. But I, you you just basically said, look, I don't know that I don't know about that research, so I let it go at that point. I'm just saying there's plenty of research out there that does show from multitude of vectors that when the when the orthography is transparent, right? That the, at least the kind of reading problems that our kids suffer with d don't don't exist. Other problems may exist depending on the language's other levels of ambiguity, but it's not at the word recognition that there's no word recognition bottleneck in the same way. And that um, really gets back to the bigger point of what is science, what is knowledge. How many people have said to me the research says, science says, studies? I understand. Say, it's like it's like Bible interpretation, especially these days. Yeah. 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 So th that's why. I, one of my goals is to teach people how to be responsible consumers of educational research. Because when someone just blurts out science says, research says, whole language has been debunked. That's my favorite one. Oh, everyone knows that. Oh, research shows. Oh, well, okay. I'm yeah, always well, going to look at research. Yeah, like I said, like, like, like I said, I, um, I agree with you on that. And I apply it to what you're saying just as much as I apply it to the other side, right? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, um, you're all 
extruding your paradigms in different ways, right? But you're you're you see the world through a particular set of mental models, and that interprets you know how you see. Speaking of research, though, one of the things you brought up that I think would be an interesting question: you think that the going back to Keith Rayner and the uh, eye movement studies and how they relate to interpreting where the bottleneck in processing is for a beginning reader. Um, you're saying, well, they're they're over phonetized. They're, they're trying to use phonics too much, and that's what's causing the stutter. Well, <clears throat> um, has anybody put through uh, that kind of eye movement studies a comparison between the students that were taught the way you're talking about and students that were taught in the more phonics science of reading thing? that were kind of otherwise peers and then put through the same process of eye movement uh, observation and studies of where their attentional bogs were. And therein lies the difficulty of educational research. You have to have number one, it's hard to find equal sample sizes, uh, teachers that do this comparative populations. It is very tough to do. And that's why we have to look at the research carefully. There are very few comparisons of a, a meaning-based approach versus a bottom-up approach. What often, One of the things that- What that, often okay. happens, let me right. complete that thought. Yeah, so yeah. That, was a, that was a no, <laughs> I guess. There, that, uh, no there isn't what? any of that research. Huh? Have, have I read? If I have it slipped my mind, I, I do remember years back look, comparing one to the other. And you have- and in a whole language approach, and I use meaning based now, showed superior. But all this stuff has to be looked at in context. When you say more effective, more effective for what, for who, how much? And no, I'm, I was particularly looking at, again, the Keith Rainer's work, and it lined up with cognitive and neuroscience and other kinds of studies that, that I've been exposed to or that I've paid attention to, basically said, look, we watch a, the stream of a reader's mind and their attention over the course of a sentence or two or a paragraph or two, and we looked at what their eyes are doing and what that reveals about what their attention is doing, then we can see that when it is the encountering of difficult words, not difficult by any abstract external measure, but difficult as experienced by the person doing the reading, when they hit difficult words, that's when their attention busts down and their process busts down or gets less efficient, right? So what I'm saying is, is that have you been able to put in people trained in phonics, early kids, uh, kids young, but trained in phonics versus the whole methods and, and seen whether or not there's a difference at the level I just described? Meaning base. And I would have to go back and look at research to, to see if I can find that. And it's very difficult to do good research like Okay, that. well, because I bring it up because you said... To, 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago, or whatever it was, that the reason that that the Keith Rayner study was showing this bog happening in relation to the difficulty of words was because those readers were trained to use phonics to to work out those words. Oh, over. So people, how you yeah. couldn't you couldn't possibly know that unless you also had the counter example, right? Yes, I can I can go back to that, but I was I got a lot of my information from the National Reading Panel report that said that very thing, that students, that phonics is becomes less effective with struggling readers after first grade. Too much. Yeah, I think it becomes, I, 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 yeah, I totally agree with that. I, in, I, the National Reading Panel. Multiple, multiple reasons, a yeah. balanced yeah. approach, a balanced approach to reading instruction. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I spent uh, six or eight hours with Shanahan um uh, and i wouldn't have said that he was uh, pro balanced and i'm it's quoting certainly to you, and he is one person but i'm quoting to you exactly from the national reading panel report it said right. it phonics should be part of a balanced reading program unquote yeah and, and, and look in, inside the paradigms i don't disagree with that i don't disagree with that that's quite a mug you got there, man. Yeah, it's a big one. And it's not a paradigm difference. It's it's I'm adhering to a theory. My theory, the interactive theory or neurocognitive theory, is how I interpret the data, the experience, what reading is. 
And I happen to think a neurocognitive theory is a robust theory, explains a lot more stuff than a top-down or a simple view of no, it. No, you guys share the same paradigm at, at a level that's different than me, right? You, you share the paradigm that, that the code is immutable, fixed object that we've got to train brains to work with. Right. I, so, I'm more comfortable so, so the, with theory rather than paradigm because paradigm really is a bigger construct. Paradigm really has to do with the whole field and the way of seeing reality. I'm more comfortable with the world of theory. Theory is a all way. Right, look, that's that's semantics. I'll go along with that. No, I mean, I, I, I would. I think. I, I think if you, I assume you've read Thomas Kuhn's. Uh, yes, I have. Structure of scientific revolutions. Yes, and I his have. definition to paradigms. Paradigm. So and in, inside of that. Though. So it's, it's a superset that organizes the perception of theories, right? Yes. So you're so for example, you have a different theory about reading than the science of reading, yeah? Many advocates, most advocates, I would say yes. Okay. And I'm I'm saying that that even though you guys have really different theories at one level, you're inside the same paradigm with respect to the orthography. Uh the tell me more about respect to orthography that you have to mm -hmm. have some working knowledge of orthography. Well, that the that that you yeah that that the orthography is fixed and static. Orthography is fixed and static. Well, as far as the spelling of words, uh, the arrangement of letters. Yeah, the the, the arrangement of letters, uh, the spelling of words. Yes, that 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 is it. It's a, it's an it's immutable, meaning that we're not going to change the spelling and we're not going to change the alphabet, and it's static, meaning that at the point that a learner is hitting an unfamiliar word, the word can't help them. They have to bring to the word everything they need to get to keep moving. The word can't help them. At the word, the word alone can't help them at some point, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think we agree on that. That's what I'm saying. So you share that paradigm. That's, that's a paradigm that's wrapped around the technology or wrapped around the artifact of the orthography. Paradigm again is a larger construct, and there's theories within. Okay, so so so, what would you call if you guys share that? Uh, if you guys are different on the core theories about reading, but you share this theory. So you're saying you you share the theory about the orthography, but you share a different theory. You have different theories about how to read with it. Picture a dot to dot picture again. That is a fact or an idea that is shared by both theories. There are overlaps between a simple view of reading and a neurocognitive view of reading. There are overlapping, there are data dots that we both share. And that sounds like one of them. Yeah, it's definitely one of them, yeah. yeah. Right, so, okay, look, I don't wanna, I would, I differ with you, but I don't wanna spend the rest of the day kind of differing on, on the terminology of things. So if you wanna call that, you share the theory of orthography and you differ on the theory of how to read with it. I, I share data dots, ideas that say that uh, orthography is less immutable. Words evolve. I'm sure the spelling of words are different now than they were 500 years ago. I mean, th it evolves. But sadly, we are stuck with this conventional way. Our convention says that English is spelled this way. And until and unless you become the grand poop of the universe, I don't think that's going to change. I would vote yeah, for that way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not it talking about changing the alphabet or the spelling. I'm talking about, like I said before, and I, and I don't mean to take us off into this prematurely. Nope, nope. I'm talking about a digital, virtual, interactive overlay yes. that is available to help anybody learn any word they encounter by conducting them through learning how the letters relate to the sounds, relate to the spelling, relate to the meaning of the word in whatever language and according to whatever background they bring to it. And that that's the necessary and uh, inevitable part of the evolution of orthography in a digital world. And we guys are arguing, you know, we're in the stone age of thinking about yeah. orthography. Still. Yes, I agree. We're back in the 60s and we have to think 30 years ahead. Absolutely. Well, 30 years from here, that's what, 30 years from now, I, that's what I'm saying. I think the whole language and reading thing will, the science of reading thing will be like, it'll be next to phrenology in the obsolete paradigm area of the library. Well, there's, there's going to be differences. And I agree that you'll be able to touch things and words will sound them out and we'll have much more 
uh, technology to draw on to teach us how to read. But in 20 years, if people are still using a phonics only bottom up approach and ass assuming everyone yeah, they, they, the same they, way, they, they, they learns the same way and you must have prescribed methods, which they're doing now in Minnesota, that will still be back in the 60s. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I, as far as I'm concerned, that the, it's just mind bogglingly. Um, this is what I mean by paradigm inertia, the way that people's um, reputations and income streams are welded and tightly bound to defending how they think about all of this is uh, paralyzing our progress and has for decades and is gonna continue to until something makes it obsolete. And um, I think what will make it obsolete is a change in the in the orthography at the, at a, in the digital ways that I'm describing it. And that's why I would vote for you for Grand Poobah of the Universe. <laughs> Because I think that was a huge thought, people's reputation and income. And that's why I'm glad I have no reputation. I'm okay being a kook and I have no yeah. income tied to any of this stuff. Uh, How do I'm you not, afford the Barbie land behind you if you don't have any income? That's... <laughs> right. I have income, but it's not related to my speaking or my books or anything yeah. else. My, Same or, thing. I've been a nonprofit since before. Yeah, exactly. So people can't say I'm doing this to make money. Yep. Yep. I hear you. I spend more on websites and other stuff than I take in. But I thought that was a very big thought. People are defending their reputation so they can get speaking gigs and consulting gigs and look at me, I'm important. And, and which is tied to their income, which is tied yep. to their prestige, which is tied to their self-esteem. And this is what I was saying. This goes all the way back. This is what there was a famous uh, uh, conversation uh that uh, Einstein and Bohr had where they got together for some conference. And as you may recall, Einstein was really against the whole quantum theory and its uh, unpredictabilities and all that kind of stuff. And Bohr was th thinking Einstein was outdated and their students all could, you know, uh, gathered together. And it led the historians of science to say, the only reason that science advances is that scientists die, <laughs> right? It, because because of the same phenomena, this this paradigm inertia, it runs right through the center of science, which runs right through the center of our world in so many different dimensions. And at the root of paradigm inertia, it's not about the paradigms, it's about the human psychology and its investments and the w ways that we defend ourselves um, where we've psychologically invested ourselves. And I'm seeing, I'm going to break it down even more. I see uh, greed and avarice getting in the way of paradigm shift. You know, in Minnesota, we have people with no understanding of reading, making these reading bills who went to first yeah. grade, that's their level. But then people want to be the next famous person. They want to be recognized, you know, it's it, and it's greed. They want to make money instead of, how can I help these teachers be ready to teach? How can yeah. I help the, this? The bigger, the bigger problem, though, this comes back to where we started with mm -hmm. teachers in a way, is that we've got a society that that has been trained out of its learning and needs to become believers, right? So we need people that want to believe in something in order to stabilize themselves. So they've got to believe in your view or somebody else's view or or some politician whose name will go beyond us today or, or or whatever they gotta believe in something to become yes. part of something to feel secure to become uh, to be uh, stable to feel good about themselves and that that's a co consequence of um them not having any faith in their own first person learning that is very deep and it goes beyond reading david absolutely they want simple answers for complex problems and phonics first is a simple answer this is why sometimes people gravitate towards extreme religious views that are black and white well that's an answer that helps me or in, or just about life. any religious view which is based on a belief rather than i mean right. spirituality is about learning religion is about belief <clears throat> right so the way and that i put it is it, as much like a religion zealous. yeah so is and i'm at, if, okay, you, I, if you if you were to line up the million people who who are lined up behind whole language and the million people that were lined up behind science of reading 
95% of them would be believers. There'd be a few that were piloters, you know, and the rest would be believers, right? That they're going along with the program because they don't trust their own first person learning agency to figure out for themselves what's really best. This back to becoming a good consumer of science. What it juxtaposes for me is that I always ask the teachers this, this question, have you ever met a toddler who gave up on learning to walk because it was a pain in the ass to fall? No, kids have an innate faith in their own agency, their own capacity to learn until they learn they can't trust it anymore. And it's that, <laughs> that's what ties into this bigger conversation about believers. And, and also if you say, where is it most kids learn that they can't trust their learning anymore? It's when they hit the artificial learning challenges of things like reading. And when reading instruction is not uh, aligned with their natural way of learning. Yeah, yeah. Which doesn't in and of itself say anything about whole language or phonics. And just... it, whole, the thing about whole language is it's not a method or approach. It's, it's a philosophy about how language is best learned. It's best learned when it's kept whole and meaningful to the greatest extent possible. So the fact, I don't know if we have thousands of believers in whole language, you know, it's become so muddled. Uh, but back to teachers and teaching, knowledge is important. And people are beginning, teachers are getting beat up out there and I hate to see it. People are not trusting teachers. They're saying teachers are failing when we jam their classes full of kids and we don't provide professional development. You cannot learn everything you need to know about being a teacher in three semesters. You need continued professional development. It takes 10 years of gaining knowledge and experience to approach teaching mastery. 10 years. Yeah, I don't know about that. I, I, I would say that, I mean, I agree with you that there's things to that they should learn, right? And again, um, like I quoted at the beginning of our last session, not that I want to go down that rabbit hole all over again, but in my interviews with uh, leading thinkers in the other side of the pond here, uh, what amazed me the most was that, that what they were arguing for was that teachers actually um, put themselves in the, from, in the position of being a struggling reader. Try to understand that from the inside out, not from the outside in. So um, it's not that it doesn't require both, but there's just no substitute for first person learning. There never is any substitute. There's first person learning and there's roboticized. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this citation because I was writing a chapter and I just happened to quote it. Kursky and Robinson, 2017, moving from novice to expertise and its implication for instruction. To become an expert, I think you have to spend 10,000 hours in something and you have to have this body of knowledge. Expert, Those are all big sweeping generalizations, right? This is, this is their research comparing knowledge and comparing experts and novices in any field. Absolutely. And to be an expert in the field, you have to have knowledge and experience. And yeah. so, so these yeah, and what, what, the thing that makes the difference between if you look if you look at it if you you look at anybody stuff. who's I'll, then I'll let you are saying we don't need teachers with any of that stuff we just need the approved curriculum shut up and follow the directions yeah absolutely I'm totally against that me too okay? thank you. And um, I, I, I spent uh, quite a lot of time arm wrestling with Siegfried Engelman. You know him? You know of him? I probably read him, but I don't have a, a memory. He's the grand poobah of direct instruction. Oh. He was the one that Washington, D.C. said, well, after I talked to Allington and the rest of the kooks on the one side, they said, go send David should go talk with Engelman. He'll set him straight. So I spent six hours or something with Engelman. He's on the direct instruction side, right? Scripting the shit out of everything. I was totally against, I'm totally against that, right? So what we could agree on though, was minimizing extraneous ambiguity, reducing the amount of unnecessary ambiguity that we're keeping on the learner as they're moving through any particular learning challenge. Um, 
There's been PUBAs of direct, uh, direct instruction going back 40 years ago with Robert Major and Madeline Hunter. And well, he goes back, he goes back uh, 50 or 60 years. He was, I think he started in the early 60s. I mean, he's the one that, um, if you looked up direct instruction, I think he, the general consensus is he's the kind of father of that movement. And the idea is they try to teacher proof the curriculum. If you just do this, all yep. will yep. learn. Yep. And the difference well, between a strategy and an approach, direct instruction is an important strategy that every teacher should have for certain things. But if that's all you're doing, and that's the problem with the DI people, it's a large DI, they think you need to do direct instruction for everything. It's good for low-level skills. If well, low -level I think skills, that... You must use direct instruction. Yeah, I think, I think that the argument for direct instruction is very much like the argument for phonics, which says that if children are below a certain level of prerequisite skill proficiency in terms of their language background or speed of all kinds of variables, right, then the more explicit and direct the instruction, the more probably will be effective, right? So th that's their uh, general equation. They wouldn't be talking about using direct instruction or phonics instruction in the same way with kids that are um, coming out of uh, really well-prepared trajectories in life and that don't need that kind of uh, hyper scripting. And that, that goes to your point, to a kid that's got a, 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 the right kind of um, vocabulary, the right kind of processing skills, verbal dexterities, um, uh, confidence in themselves, confidence in their learning, uh, their level is lion and many others have said they can learn with any damn system. It's the ones that are way behind the curve that we've got to bring uh, more specific, highly scripted or highly structured takeoff ramps for. And this is why direct instruction is one method of teaching phonics. Now, according to the National Reading Panel report, there's direct instruction with this synthetic phonics. There's analytic phonics. There's embedded phonics, teaching phonics by spelling. And there's analogy or word parts or large unit phonics. And what does the National Reading Panel Holy Book Report say? All are equally effective. Meaning that if I'm only doing direct instruction, with synthetic they're, they're, phonics, I am falling yeah. far short of the glory. Teachers need to use the approach that's working with their kids and use them all. Well, that last part of what you said is what's most important, right? Is that all these things may be generally relevant. Yes. What's particularly relevant depends on the particular child. And there we got it. Research can support something. Research shows that, but it's effective for who, for what, for what purpose. Exactly. Yes. And it doesn't matter if it's effective with 80% of the population, if it's not effective for your kids. It gives us yep. a sense of what might work, but the teacher is the ultimate filter. How is this working with my kid? Yep. And I can't exactly. tell you how many times I have it all planned out how I'm gonna work with a kid, sit down with the kid, the plans go out the window. That's what- Yeah, well, that, that's because you're paying attention to the kid. Yes. So you're not running robotically method. according to what you think they should, how they should be taught. Your 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 knowledge and skills as being differentially adapted to what um, feedback you're getting from observing the actual child following you. Or, Absolutely, as you're pushing the child. Right, we agree yeah. on that. And that, teachers, in that we totally agree. Yeah, teachers yeah. should be able to use their experience and expertise. At the same time, they should have some knowledge of of research based tools. Science of reading is saying, shut up and follow the directions. This is the way you do it. Yeah, I think that's an that's an unfortunate characterization. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't I can't speak for the entire country and all the different ways that science of reading is being rammed down the throats of people all over the country. I can't speak to that. I can tell you that the people that I talk to that are the foundational core people to the emergence of the science of reading that's in prominence today, that those people would say, no, <laughs> it's not about following some mechanical script. It's about getting teachers to really ask themselves, what does it take to learn to read, to actually be like you were just describing, sync up with what's going on in the child and unfold a pathway that works for them. And 
we can have the researchers over there who are saying these things, but when it becomes to state legislatures, the political and the for-profits get involved, and all of a sudden you're having curriculum that is mandated. You're having approaches. You're having professional development like letters. Yeah. Now this this cuts into another conversation. I, I, I know you don't like these characters, but I'm just going to use them as a quick reference point. I I interviewed the people that were the architects of the No Child Left Behind movement, right, back in the Bush administration. And um, they said building on Haberman's work and Allington's work and Hanischek's work at the uh, Hoover Institute and a bunch of others, they, they came up with this model that said roughly one third of the teachers out there understand what they're doing and care about the students. Ooh, that hurts. One, third of, one third of the teachers out there, right, care about the students but don't know what they're doing. And one third of the teachers out there don't care about the teach students and don't know what they're doing. So that two th in other words, two thirds of the teacher population was pretty much incompetent and about two thirds of the teacher competent, uh, uh, two thirds cared, but two thirds were incompetent. Well, two things, of course, you know, how did that no child left behind work out? How did that work out? It didn't. And characterizing teachers that way is very hurtful. I understand, I understand, I understand. Well, yeah, but, but that I, what is I'm a saying, what I'm saying. Perception. That is a common exactly, and that is why that is life. that common perception that leads to what you were just describing. The reason why state houses and for-profit organizations are able to to force this kind of a structural, um, systematic way of doing things is because they don't trust the teachers to be first-person learning agents that can differentiate them uh, what's necessary for each child. And so, why, because why they don't that? trust the teachers to. Huh? Why don't they trust it? Two things. The teacher bashing, it's a, become a political football. It's easy to bash a teacher. Overcrowding, all the other variables, including healthcare and nutrition, and add on top of that, this myth that's created that there's a crisis in reading. That is a myth. That is a myth, but they're perpetuating that at the expense of learning, at the expense of teachers. So, so according so 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 you don't think NAEP is um accurate. How much would you discount NAEP? NAEP? Oh, I think NAEP is is a good reliable source. And well, NAEP, NAEP, says, NAEP that, says NAEP NAEP says 84% of African American fourth grade children are underwater in reading, improficient with reading. And, and that's still 80% 80 80% of African American kids are that way in the 12th grade. Overall, it says almost two thirds of all the kids in this country are chronically not good enough at reading on grade level from the time they enter school to the time they leave. And let's take a look at the NAEP data. NAEP shows that in general scores are have been rising uh, slightly since 1972. They can go very slightly. Well, it's can, near. It's closer to flatlined than rising. Since look from seventy two to two thousand twenty. I do. I've got it all over my website. I can show yes, you an image of it. It's pretty much flatlined. Uh, is there a well flatline? Is there a statistically significant difference? And it has that little asterisk between nineteen seventy two and today. When you look at it from that. You know, the graph can look kind of flat, but look to see if they're statistically significant. Data. Yeah. So we so we so, went from 90% African American to 86%, so, right? They have How's these, that progress? They have these categories called proficient, not proficient. These are arbitrarily defined categories. Arbitrarily defined. They do that in Minnesota. They don't report scores. They report percentages of students who fall in categories. That gives us no comparative data. Is there an achievement gap? There is an equity gap, meaning that students of color, students in low SES, they have an unfair disadvantage based on- Yeah, we're still, we're still talking about almost 60% of all kids are improficient by their standards. Are improficient. Improficient. Improficient, uh, below the level of being proficient, where, where my understanding from talking with the people that design NAEP is that proficiency is the threshold at which if they're below proficiency, then their, their reading is interfering with learning in their grade level. They're not able to read transparent, reading is not transparent to learning in their grade level. And here's how you solve that. 
you just lower the level of what you decided proficiency is. And that is the snake oil, the scam that goes on. So he, then you don't trust Nape. That's what I asked you a minute ago. You think Nape was, I asked you, what did you think of Nape? And you said you thought it was a good source of information. It was. It was. I don't agree with the categories. It is a good, it is a good source of data. It gives us a general sense of how. So how does it, how does it really, isn't it amazing to you that the NAL and NAEP line up so well? Now. That. that the National Adult uh, Literacy Studies. The, the, the U.S. Department of Education has the K-12 and it has NOW, which studies the adult literacy, right? Uh -huh. And the adult literacy, when you look at the number of adults that are reading at fifth or sixth grade level, for example, kind of matches up with the number of kids coming out of K-12 that are below proficient. Uh -huh. so how can these two different systems fit so well together? This is why I can't compare uh, children in K-12 to adults. It's two different populations. Well, we the, when you, we're talking about 12th graders coming out of school yeah, and yeah. their reading scores pretty much yeah. match up with adult literacy in the country. Adult, so, literacy. adult <laughs> literacy is something different, but let me just uh, mention that. Reading is a skill that continues to grow and get better as you get older. I'm a better reader. Yeah, you continue to learn to be better. Grow you is you get something more happens to sponges. It's like playing the piano. You're able to process things and you have knowledge that helps you read better. I'm a better reader now at 65 than I was at 55 because I've had millions of more words poured over my head. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on all that. Yeah. I don't see how that answers anything I just have put up though. Well, when they're making these comparisons to kids in school or even in 12th grade with adults. Now, if you want to talk about uh, people. I'm not, they're not making the comparison. I'm saying there seems to be a reciprocal, credibilizing uh, relationship between NAL's adult literacy studies and NAEP's K-12 studies that if K-12 is speaking, if K-12 was really off, you'd see the greater proficiency in adult population. The fact that they they kind of work together, they kind of fit together, even though they're being um, arrived at or uh, the kind of data that's underneath getting to them is from two different planets. And I guess to answer your question that, NAEP, I rely on that data. I think the categories are arbitrarily defined. The data is the, 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 so what, so so how much so discount that for me? Do you, they make a distinction between basic and proficiency? Forget yeah. about advanced and all that stuff. Yep. The majority of kids in the country are below proficient on their scale, right? Below, and it gets and it's if you disaggregate that to poverty and children of color, it gets worse and worse and worse up into the eighty percent, like I mentioned, right? But even though the average. Um, a uh, white child well off is in the 50s, but more than half of them are below proficient. When I go to the school districts that I talk to or go to, they don't have any problem saying that th they agree with it in terms of their experience of how much reading is interfering with learning in their classrooms. I haven't had anybody come back. I've had some state legislators come back and push back on that stuff for political reasons, but I've never had educators go, wow, NAEP is just really off doesn't fit my experience in my school quite the contrary and the question is you know it, comparing now to 10 years ago to 20 years ago are those scores going down and these are arbitrarily not the categories but the average scores the average scores the categories what is proficient and basic the average scores have changed very very little in 30 years they've got well pop pop one of them up on the screen you know, when you look at the fourth grade, the eighth grade, the 12th grade, it seems if you look at that from a distance, but you have to look at statistically significant change. If you get a large population and a score goes from 257 to 261, that could be a statistically significant difference. It may not seem like that for the average. I'm not saying it's not statistically significant, but when you talk about still half of the kids in this country um, learning to feel less confident in their mind, in their learning because of their difficulty with reading. And that's been going on for more than 30 years. And it involves a significant dimension of our population. It's hard not to think that there's a reading problem in this country. 
Well, the, th the thing was, there's a crisis, you're greedy. We must do better. There has always been problems with how we teach reading. People should be more literate, absolutely. And if they took a meaning-based approach, that would occur. I know that's a generalization. But the fact that reading used to be better 10 years ago, 20, 30, and now it's worse and there's this bad crisis, that is a myth. That it's somehow worse right now. And yeah, that's... And that's that's the difference between research and data. This is this is thirty years. Uh... Yeah, that's. I want to see the the actual scale. I, I want to see the NAEP data, not how someone chooses to present the NAEP data. This is the. This is why you have to be a responsible consumer of this stuff, David. This is, this is NAEP data. This is NAEP data right here. Yes. But I put this other... together. I made, I created this from NAEP. Okay. Every percentage you see, this is across a 30 year span. If you keep going with this, let me mute it because you don't need to hear no, it. No, no, no. That's okay. And it's not that I don't love and trust you, David, but I want to go back to. Here, here you go. Here's the scale scores. Okay. Yes. And That's I want 217, 220. Fourth grade, 217, right. 220. Yep. Out of. 500. So is it significant? Three, three points? Yeah. Does it point still to a massively ugly situation? Yes. Why, tell me more about that. What this is saying is in 2000 or 1992, and I don't know, yep. we don't have the statistical significance scores here. It would have a little asterisk. Is it statistically significant in uh 2018, the latest one is 2022, is there a statistically significant difference? Meaning, are we getting worse? There's going to be natural ebbs and flows, ups and downs in the data. Is it a statistically yeah, look, significant difference? The overall picture is, so maybe maybe back in, 2000, in 1992, 68% of kids were below proficiency and today only 66, but geez, 66 is terrible. It's not about the small gain. It's about the overall big picture. We're talking about general reading scores, the average. Is there this crisis? And we're not talking categories. We're talking average scores. Those categories are arbitrarily defined. You can't compare percentages in categories that are arbitrarily defined. If they said, I think this is below proficiency. I think this is basic. Is there a gap in scores? Absolutely. There's an equity gap. Do we need to address reading differently? Absolutely. Is the science of reading going to fix that and make scores go up? We tried that with the Reading First Initiative 20 years ago. That came out of no child yeah. behind. That's essentially yeah. what science of reading and, is. And, 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 the, and they would say that the, the, the um, was it a decade long subscription to whole language that occurred in California in the, what was it, 80s or something like that, led to the greatest generational loss of learning in the state of California's history. And that's what get, they used as an argument for the science of reading. So exactly. they would come back and say the same thing about what you're saying. No, actually, that uh, that study in California, that, that wasn't a research study. That was people looking at data. When they actually looked at uh, NAEP scores and they differentiated between those who identified as whole language and those who identified Wait a minute, as now, you're, now, now you're quoting NAEP scores? I absolutely believe NAEP scores are good. It's it's the categories within. But they so, found so, that whole so, language teachers actually had higher scores than those who identified as skills-based. But that's one research study. It doesn't prove anything. But this idea that whole language was the variable, was the cause of something, that is naive, unscientific thinking. Sadly, well, that's the kind of thinking that's used by science of reading advocates. There is hard data on the Reading First Initiative that it was a billion dollar boondoggle. States got money if they subscribe to it. They got lots of money. So on the state level, California and Florida, some of these were going, oh, this is great. Give me more money. But when the national people looked at it, they said, this is a billion dollar boondoggle. And that's what science of reading is going to be like five years down the line. People are going to say, that silly little bald man, maybe he had a point. 
Yeah, well, unfortunately, the science of reading thing get, got its power from the decoding dyslexia groups that have forced the legislators to adopt science of reading as Absolutely. it relates to the dyslexia movement, right? So, um, look, there's no question that it's just all about politics in a way. And money. Cycle and and the assumption that we can't solve these problems in an entirely different way by making the orthography elastic. We could have done this decades ago already. Anyway, back to the um, point about NAEP. So discount it. What do you, how many kids do you, if you disagree with NAEP's categorization, do you agree that, that there's a line that we should draw somewhere between what you might call elemental basic skills, where somebody who could take a long time to read a label on a pill bottle is different than somebody who can read fluently at the level of um, complexity and uh, vocabulary necessary to be successful at their grade level in school, right? There's a difference between those, yeah? There's differences, yes. Okay, so so would you agree with a, as a as a conceptual definition for the moment that with proficiency, what we hope to mean by that term is that reading would be transparent to learning at the in the uh, written content of your grade level. Reading would be comparable to the written content at your grade level. No, reading would be transparent to it. You could, in other words, reading would not be a bot, would not interfere with learning. It would be transparent to learning at the grade level. So when you're reading a fifth grade textbook that requires you to understand uh, the language there, that reading wouldn't be a problem for you learning from that textbook right? L reading wouldn't be a problem from you doing research or doing what any kind of classroom assignments that required reading at that grade level. So proficiency means that your reading skills, your reading abilities are transparent to your ability to learn at the grade level you're in. Uh, we need to read at a certain level, but grade levels are an abstraction. They're not of very Of course accurate. they are, but they do exist. They do let exist. Me, they create fifth thought. grade textbooks. When you say something right? is at the fifth grade level, therefore a fifth grader should be able to read it. Well, if one is familiar with the concepts that are being described, sentence complexity, vocabulary, that yep, all yep, impacts all that. your ability to read. So if you're coming here without experiences, with different experiences, with culturally different experiences, you are going to score lower on these grade level measures. Doesn't yep. mean that the reading instruction is bad. It's probably culturally biased. If we tapped into students' natural ways of well, learning and incorporated- That you can culture, get at by disaggregating all these scores, you know, and that's a different conversation. We can do that. That wasn't my question. I was just trying to get a handle on where do you, how would you describe proficiency? Uh, that, and to me, what I'm describing, I'm saying proficiency, Grade level proficiency means reading is not an in, is not interfering. It's making learning possible at the grade level content of your grade level. And yes, we could say grade levels are blurry and they're arbitrary. And yes, yes, yes. But nonetheless, there's fifth grade textbooks and eighth grade textbooks, right? There are all kinds of materials that are generated around the assumption of grade level categorization. So inside those categorizations, which are part of the conventional system of education, proficiency means that if you're a sixth grade proficient, that reading is not an issue for you inside that space. Yeah, you may have background knowledge issues, you may have um, vocabulary issues, but if you can read well, you could learn those things as you encounter them in the classroom or in the textbook. To say it's an issue is a deficiency lens. If you are proficient, you're able to create meaning with print. There's more complex and less complex. I get uncomfortable with uh, quantifying uh, students and students learning. I know there has to be some sort of bar. Uh, but I think the bigger question is, are there categories? Who decided this is proficient, this isn't proficient? What type of material are you reading? I don't know if we're coming to any anything here. Well, I mean, a, a whole a, a, a massive gathering of educational scientists and researchers are uh, pulled into the Institute of Educational Science to flesh out and work out some kind of consensual understanding about how to make these categories. So it's not uh, just your thinking or my thinking, but it's some kind of consensus of 
the people that study that th those distinctions, right? And could they make mistakes? Sure. But are they making mistakes that are a radical magnitude of order off? I don't think so. I mean, given given the uh, uh, manifest intelligence in our population, it, I don't think so. <laughs> It goes back to the categories are arbitrarily defined, and they said this is proficient, this is basic, this is that. So, yeah, and I was just trying to say, if you just want to throw them out, how much should we discount them in order to make it safe for your mind? If uh, you think that's, where would you draw the proficiency line on the spectrum that we were looking at? Uh, do I have to make a decision right now? I don't know. I, I don't feel no. comfortable drawing a proficiency line on a measure like that. Do uh, you, so then you don't think, I mean, then why, if, if we're not going to do that, then why assess reading at all? It gives us a general sense of where we're at. We should not rely on that. That should not be, that is just a general sense of where we're at. And does it support that there's a massive reading crisis? No. And that was the basis of the argument. There's a massive failure and NAEP data simply does not show that. Well, that's that. That's totally a matter of interpretation. It, Nape says to me, um, eighty plus percent of African American kids and sixty plus percent of white and everything in between, based on socioeconomics and color and all the other variables, that but the majority of kids in this country are underwater with reading, meaning that their capacity for reading is less than what's required to be successful in school at every level and throughout school. Absolutely. But the thesis was... Then how can that not be a reading crisis if you just agreed with that? The, 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 the argument that's been made is there a crisis, the scores are going down, and we have to do something differently. And my... No, thesis, no, 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 no. The scores no, no, are this, going down. They have, it's not about whether the scores are going down. It's whether the whole big picture is bad. That we always need to improve our ability to teach reading. Absolutely. How many, oh, let's put it another way, how many kids should be improficient? How many kids is an acceptable percentage of our population to be not good enough at reading in school? Uh, the, what do you think? A hundred percent of children should be able to create meaning with print so that they can see, succeed so they can learn. The, the, the argument is scores are going down. We need to do something radically different. And it's it's this variable. It's because people aren't teaching phonics is the reason why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's different. I'm not. I'm but not that's about the phonics. argument that's We've being been... made. That's. Why I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm saying the whole system has been chronically not good enough at getting enough kids to be proficient in reading for as long as we can remember, as long as we've got data. I agree that it's we been, have no. To... It's been not good enough at getting the uh, the majority of our population to read well enough to be successful in school for as long as we've known. I agree with that. I okay, agree that's the that. point. That's the problem. That's the crisis. It doesn't have to do with little tiny fluctuations in the data line. Well, that's- I the, don't care about that's that. That's the argument that's being made. There's this sudden not crisis me. that we, well, not for you, I'm sorry. That's what the okay. science, that's a manufactured crisis. That, was it a crisis 10 years ago? Was it a crisis 30 years ago? Yeah. Why um, do we th want to th go this... back to the 1960s with our instruction if there was a crisis yeah. then, and we're using the same method. Yeah, yeah no, I, I I completely disconnect this from methods of teaching. I'm saying the whole system is underwater. It's been underwater for as long as we've known. And that for me, the big consequence of this isn't even reading. It's that how does a kid feel who goes through their entire educational experience feeling not good enough mentally? Absolutely. I think what does it do to it. them? But I can't yeah. connect. I can't disconnect with methods of teaching because that's affecting real teachers and real kids. Yeah, but all all the methods of teaching, despite the fact that you don't think they're at war, have, they've been in conflict with each other, and the consequence of that is this near flat line of terrible end results with respect to our whole population and reading. Our whole population and reading is terrible and has been for as long as we keep track of it and we keep arguing over how to teach it in different ways. We must continue to think about how to teach it. Absolutely. That there's yeah. been this this proven study that whole language causes something or this is the variable. Yeah. Yeah. It's I don't think that I, I again I, I think I think all of these 
paradigms, theories, models, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, are warped around certain assumptions that themselves were going to are going to be blown up in the next few years, and it isn't going to matter that much. But that the prop the big problem is we need to do something about this because the 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 great hope of America and the world and our kids and our futures is turning up the learning radically turning up the learning and the, one of the biggest obstacles to turning up the learning in our world is how many kids are stuck in this ladder of to learning to read I, I, we agree on that and i agree with you so the next question and maybe the conversation for next time is how what can we do to create to better prepare teachers but to better prepare our students to read and meet the complexities of the real world. What can we do differently? Yep, yep, and I'd love That's that. So let's do this. Time. Let's divide up our time next time. And I want to give you, and, and rather than me kind of pushing you around as you say things and are you doing that with me, uh, let's take half the time and you just present what you think is the way to go. Oh. And I will and I will kind of push back on it, but, but leave you to drive the current. And you do the same for me, and I'll give my sense of where the orthography transformation needs to happen. Okay, so what do I think should be included in a reading program, reading curriculum? Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, okay. like you're going to change. You're going to change the world. You're, this whole thing okay. we talked about today, this problem, right? Yeah. How would you do it? How would you, if you could be the grand poobah, as you say, right? What would you do to change the reading trajectory of the country? I will tell do the you how to solve that problem next time. So listeners, stay tuned in two weeks because I'm going to show you how to solve David Smiley, how You're to gonna, solve the reading problem. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I'm going to make a suggestion of my own that'll be different. <laughs> I love this, David. I love it. Yes, I, because I think it's bringing us back to the brass tacks. What do we do? What do we need more of? What do we need less of? Okay. Is that a good place to stop? That's it for today, yeah. All right. Yep. I'll, I'll stop the recording here.